Well, it's only been two years since I built this server. Yeah, this one right here. It's been befitting that I'm gonna do something with it now, finally. Yeah, it's got a lot of cool hardware in it and we're gonna use it for something seemingly remedial. And I figured, and I figured, and I figured who better to talk about a delayed project than bring the king of delayed projects himself, Barnacle. I made a video once. <laughs> You know what, guys? I got new merch. It's available now, crowdme.com slash jc2cents. We got zip up hoodies, we got tri blend, we got a new logo. I digress since 2012. It's a digress logo. You guys have been asking for that. But anyway, we're all going. We got all kinds of stuff zip up hoodies, beanies, polos. Don't take my word for it because obviously I can't do this ad. So just look in the description below and you guys will find the link. Thanks. <laughs> No, in all seriousness, I flew Jerry down here for two reasons. One, to prove you guys I haven't murdered him. I, I don't hate him as much as you guys think I do. And to prove that you can still get away with only buying one ticket to get you on the plane. That was self -proof. It was a first class ticket. If it needed two of those, there's a divider. It doesn't work that way. Okay, so hardware wise, I'm gonna kind of go through this again very quickly. We did a whole build video on this where I was like, the next part, we're gonna actually turn it into a raid. And we never did that. Um, like, Long time ago. So it's got the same drives in it that it had initially. We had 15 10 terabyte Iron Wolf drives. We have got eight of them in here. Two of them are in Phil's rig now, and then five of them are still sitting in a box. That Humble way we, brag. We, well, no, we can expand it, right? That's yeah. part of the thing with Unraid. Um, we are using Unraid for this though. Um, for its ease of use and its flexibility, and we'll talk about that. I've never actually set one up. Jerry's already played around with this, and I did fly him down here to help us make sure that this was in its best shape possible. He's way more informed than I am when it comes to the software side of things. I'm a hardware guy, there's no, there's no hiding that. Um, I'm running a RAID controller here, which is a SAS slash RAID controller, to control our eight drives. Um, so it is using a, uh, a SAS breakout to four SATA per side, and there's two, yep. technically two controllers in there, I guess. And then uh, they're going to our drives right here and they are numbered so we can kind of keep tabs on what's what. But the beauty of it is we're not using it as a RAID controller. We're not, we're using it as a SAS, <laughs> basically a SAS or a SATA controller at that point to yeah. add more ports to our motherboard. Because even though we are using an ASUS WS X299 Pro, which is a workstation board. How do you remember that number? Jeez. That's all I do is remember numbers now. Um, for some reason on the previous X299 WS-10G, it had like 10 SATA ports. This one's got six. So for whatever reason, Asus kind of pedaled, backpedaled and went backwards in the, the hardware side of this. You're getting trolled, buddy. It also doesn't have a 10G wire, or wireless, it doesn't have a 10G wired NIC built in, so we had to add one of those two. For this, we went with the yeah. Action um, AQN1-107. I'll put links to these in the description. I did get them off Amazon. The controller, if you're curious, it's the yeah. LSI-2008-8i. Um, we were gonna do free NAS. Yes, be, yes. So Unraid was always the plan because it gave us the ability to, with FreeNAS, you can't use a, a, a box with a head on it, right? It's, it's headless, you can't use VMs, and, and, and I guess you can, but it's really convoluted. It's it's very convoluted and from the command line primarily. Think of it as like FreeBSD. And free it's all BSD running off a of Linux backbone or back, uh, Well, FreeBSD, similar though. A lot okay. of art, you'll get a lot of arguments from the tech community, but yeah, a Nix oh, yeah. okay. based off. I forget I said that, but the point is, Unraid was gonna be a lot easier for us to, to build a server in a tower like this that you could physically sit at, at a box that would run a virtual machine that you could use this as if it were a desktop, you'd never know the difference, but it was also connected to the network to work as a NAS. Our situation for the company has changed in the way that we're doing things now, so that's no longer the case or the necessity. So I could rip out this, this 1920, or not 1920, um, 7920X, 10 core, 20 thread Intel CPU. So overkill. And go with like a small ITX, like i3 or something, because it's just a controller for Unraid. That's all it basically yeah. is. Yeah. Um, but because the original hardware that's in here is already here, we're just using it. But I wanted to mention that with Unraid, that was something you could do. And the reason why we had the Titan X sitting in there is because of the fact that all of that pass through was gonna happen through the GPU. So the faster and the beefier and the higher VRAM and all that stuff with the GPU, the better it would have been for that virtual machine experience interacting with the virtual machine and the physical yeah. NAS inside. But we're not doing that anymore, but we are still using Unraid. Yes. Now I've never actually done Unraid, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna sit down and just kind of work my way through it. Jerry's gonna kind of help me as I go. This is not a tutorial. I just wanna preface that. Nope. This is the second part of us building this where we're finally gonna have a place to archive all of our footage because we are definitely starting to use up our storage. Um, we are gonna be also turning this into a Steam game server. So it's gonna be mounted to our network through a 10G connection, which we already said. And I would love a 40G, but I don't have fiber and all that here to, to do that, but. <clears throat> Goals. I know, right? It's going to allow us though, when we do our benchmarking, the problem with our benchmarking is we'll pull out the test bench or maybe have to reinstall an operating system entirely. And like when the new Ryzen stuff came yeah. out, that was all fresh installs of everything. And if you've ever had to install a game like 
let's just say GTA 5. That's like 78 gigabytes yeah. or something like that. Just about yeah. everything, including Even like if you have a gigabit right? yeah. down like we do here, it still takes like 30 minutes to download the game. Yep. And that's just per one game. So what we want to do is mount this on the network, have our games installed here, and all of our machines are just pointed at this network drive for the installation location, yep. which means your game or Phil's games are gonna be on there, my games are gonna be on there, Nick's games could be on there, and then whoever's account you log into on whatever machine is still gonna pull all those files. And then when we log into our main machines, it'll trigger the updates and, and all that sort of stuff. So that's the other idea behind it. I'm most excited about that, to be honest, than the archiving of footage and the backing up of data and super sensitive stuff. It's the fact that I won't have to wait for Steam. Yep. Plus, Phil can mine crypto coins in jail. No, he can't. No clue. All right, so let's see. The username here is root, and then there's no passwords. You just hit enter. How'd you know that? Magic of editing. So this is the GUI, obviously. You've got your yep. dashboard, main share, so you plug in. See, running under Firefox. That's why you need 64 gigs of RAM. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to hurry because it's eating it as we go. <laughs> All right, so what we want to do right here is the first stage setup, Jay. So go to your dashboard right here and click on that. And you can go ahead and give your machine a name. We've already gone in on the last boot and did some of this stuff. You got your, your nasty server. What are we going to call it now? I'm going to call it J-Rocks. Like it, like a dog. What are you going to put in there? Let's see. It's important to personalize, guys. It's really important to personalize your stuff. And I know this sounds like some sort of a uber shilly, like, unrate video, but they don't even know we're making this video right now. This no, as a matter of fact, we were going to use FreeNAS. We Here's my use recommendation free to use FreeNAS. And, and literally, guys, look at this. Yeah. We started with FreeNAS at 9 a.m., <laughs> and that's how long it took us to decide. We finally just said, okay, yeah. we're doing Unraid. We were going to do FreeNAS because we were like, well, we don't need the pass-through option anymore for VM and all that stuff because we're not going to use it as a physical box that you're sitting at. Um, so I ordered these 10G cards uh, and FreeNAS, and even though it says they are supported by FreeBSD and FreeNAS is built on FreeBSD. It is. These NIC cards are not supported. And because there's no 10G built into this motherboard, we were going to have a 1G connection for our server, which is obviously not good enough. So right. we basically said, screw it. Yep. We'll go with Unraid anyway. And I think we're happy that we did. All right, so let's get the disk set up. It's very easy to do. Just go up here and click on main. That's your next little option over. And down here, you have parity disks. Parity disks are your disks that basically, when they're built, if you have a failure of a drive in the system, the parity disk steps in and saves you, basically. The reason it's called Unraid is because this is literally not a RAID, and there's a lot of pros and cons to that. But in our case, it's pros. They should have called it N-A-D-D-A-R-E-R. -E Not a raid. <laughs> Not a raid. There you go, patent pending. <laughs> so what we want to do here is assign the drives to their roles. So go ahead and pick one of these drives. Um, and then your parity drive too. Let's go ahead and pick one more. Now we have two parity drives. That's going to oh, leave you. It shows you the smart tip of them too. Oh, dude, it shows even, so much. So info. one of my concerns was that these are, these, these are drives that are designed to be in like Two, or four U blades, two U blades and yes. stuff, which normally have like either Delta or Alta Kazi fans just blasting air at them. Cause they're in a data center, who cares how oh, massive, it is. Oh, massive, yeah. My concern about me filling up the whole front of these with drives and being in a standard box like this is yep. they wouldn't have decent airflow. Um, but with the fans running full speed on the front of this through an AIO, I actually have an AIO on this, which yep. should be an air cooler for the ultimate reliability. Um, they're, they're running nice and cool. Although yeah. they're not being taxed right now. But I'll, I can monitor this though. If, yeah. if he goes, if I'm on the GUI and he goes in and he starts like just slamming it with data and, yep. and read and write and all that, we can see a hot. And we'll set it up to send you notifications if anything okay. goes sideways. Mm -hmm. So now we've got six drives remaining. Let's go ahead and start assigning those to these six disk slots. Just grab the first one from each oh, one. Oh, cool. So it does remove, remove it yeah, from the absolutely. list. Oh, yep. okay. I thought you said no. Nope. All right. Nope. So go ahead, grab that one and just go down the list until you exhaust all your drives. That should give you six. But, but not the SSD. Not the SSD. SSD. We do not want to add the SSD. Because that's our cache. Yep. Go ahead and assign your so cache. So if drive. I wanted to add another cache, I just put the other drive in, boot it back up, and then add it here. Yes, then another slot. It's that it's easy. It's that simple. Well. All right, so here's our cache drive, I assume. There's our SSD. Yep. Yeah, so we could have done this with all SSDs, I guess like Linus did with one and stuff. Yep. Um, and if we want to add more cache, we could just plop. Does it, does it have to be a match drive, the same capacity? Do we know this? Uh, as far as I know, no. Huh. So I could just plop in a 500 gig if I wanted and so. Okay. We'll From play. what I saw earlier, I'm going to assume that, but it's possible that if you want to raid those, which is another option, you can raid the cache drives in prison performance, then I would assume you want them to be the same. All right, so now what you're going to see right here is that down here, it's building the parity and formatting the drives. All right, so this is at 0.1% on parity. Okay. Correct. This so if we wanted to build it out right now, test it, get it, get our, our network locations and all that set up, Yep. we can do that. And then when we're done at the end of the day, just tell it to go. Hope we don't have a power outage because we don't have yep. a UPS hooked up to it. And, <laughs> and then, you should uh, have a yeah, UPS. Yeah, I know that's yeah. next. It support, that's it supports next. it too. Is it's it good. all set up now? Mm, the, the drives are. We don't have shares. We don't have a way to access oh, them yet. Okay. All you've done is told it that you want to make one 
We have, a, we have the warehouse, yeah. but no doors. Correct. What we want to do is we want to pause the rebuild operation that's in progress. Go ahead and hit pause. You don't want to hit cancel because if you hit cancel, you're starting over from scratch. Okay. So if you're right. at like 30% after five hours, then you'd start all over. You hit cancel, you're going to kick yourself in the teeth. Okay. All right. So now this is, this is pause. What we want to do is we want to go and create a share. Okay. So share is basically, is, it's going to look like a drive on the network. Yeah. So how we have eight drives in this machine, if we added multiple shares, it looked like, if we added eight of them, it would look like eight drives. Yeah. So we don't need that. We just need a main access point to this box. And so we have one share and then everything's broken out in that one share. Unless you want to have more granular control, you can create other shares. So I'm going to, I'm going to call this big old thing. And you can rename these at any point. None of this, <laughs> not, none of this is Comments. solidified. Yeah. <laughs> Big ladies. Old bang, ladies, there you go. I like it. Oh my okay. god, that's amazing. <laughs> so, okay, what you really want to look at those included discs. Notice how it says all. Oh, okay. That's good. That means that when you're copying stuff to this, it's going to spread it out amongst all those discs best that it can. All right. So for users, you don't need to make a user to access. This is this is visible on the network right now. Yes. Okay. But having the default root with no password account is dangerous because anyone with access to this then could log into it and be disrupted. Literally anybody on your network could take out Okay, everything. so yep. we're not gonna do it right now because it's just Phil and I, but it's probably best practice to go in here, create another user and probably change the password and stuff on root. Yep, Okay. So simple as that, clicking on that and change the just password. Just like you wouldn't take your default router out of the box and not change the admin password. Okay, so there's a lot of other tools and stuff you could probably look at here, but for the, I mean, this was never meant to be a tutorial. This is just kind of showing some of the use case of Unraid because one of the biggest things, like when we when we built this, and I said we were gonna be using Unraid in that video, so many people were like, why are you using Unraid? Why, free NAS, free NAS, free NAS. We spent two days. Well, you spent all of yesterday. That was because and, of a hardware misconfiguration, okay. but it is but, more complicated. And, then, and yes. then three quarters of today, just trying to get free NAS to work with our freaking NIC card. Yes. And that was and that was both of you. And yep. both of you kind of know what you're doing with Linux, at least to yep. some degree. You do, he does, and you guys kind of overlapped who knew what, and you guys still couldn't get the damn thing to work. And I think, what, you found one user online that got it to work? All right, so here's what I'm yeah. gonna do. I'm gonna get my laptop, I'm gonna fire it up, and and then, um, or actually, let's do this. Let's go to Phil's machine real quick. Okay. Because he's on the 10G, my wireless, what good is that? I mean, we can access files, but speed is important because you could edit off this if you wanted. Yes. Um, that's not the idea behind it, but you could. And so let's go ahead, since this is wired, through Cat5e, I wanna point that out. We are using a 100 foot Cat5e cable running all the way across the studio and into the office. Just to show you that you don't need Cat6 if you're not running long distances. It's still, you know, why not use it if it's, if it's there and it's the same price, but this is probably not the best way to do this. We're gonna show you still what the read write speeds are on this and we're gonna talk about what affects those speeds. All right, so the switch we're using here is the Asus XGU2008. It's a 10 gigabit base, which means it has two 10 gigabits uh, connections on there and then the rest are the standard uh, one gigabit. We also had to change up our set, uh, network setup a little bit. Some of you guys might have noticed that when we redid the wiring here, or I redid the wiring, I completely screwed it up where I was going modem to switch to router, which was kind of really screwing up our network path and was the way um, IPs were being handed out was not right. And so it was causing us all kinds of problems. So what we did was we actually relocated the modem from here, it's just hooked up to nothing, back out next to the router. And then we're going from router to the switch and then the switch to the computers and stuff here. But his computer is hooked up to the 10G port, and so is the server we just set up out there with that really long cat 5 b cable, which we talked about. So this is the other end of that 100 foot cable. So let's go ahead and see now how our cat 5 e is doing in terms of dragging and dropping a file. So how big is this file, Phil? So I made a custom little really big zip that's 15 gigabytes, and- All right, so here's big O thing, the one I made right there, right? So if I just drag and drop, right? Yep. We are getting 1.1 gigabytes per second and it's dropping down a little bit. So right to about 475. Um, but I mean, we don't normally work off of 15 gigabyte files. In fact, an entire video when we shoot on our FS5 or FS7 is usually around 20 to 22 gigabytes, depending on the project. If it's like a PC build with lots of B-roll, um, it's lots of smaller, like one gigabyte files too. So. This is actually really, really good. Even 500 megabytes a second, considering we're dealing with spinning drives on a 10G connection is actually something that is um, really good. So that's that. Basically, um, I mean, an idiot can do it. I kind of sort of did. Jerry need to, needed to help me. So I guess you have to get your own Jerry if you want help. So we're gonna have Jerry actually copy the file again, because I want to see what's happening here with the interface. I want to see what's happening with the memory, and I want to see what's happening with the drive temps. 
because my biggest concern is obviously going to be uh, he's going to start doing it right now. So my biggest concern was going to be drive temps and stuff, considering we're not in a blade server. All right, go for it. There we go. So you can see the CPU. Dude, wow. That's, that's a decent amount of CPU being used, actually, in my opinion. Look at that. But the drive temps are not really changing at all. We did peg a H3, HT thread. And you can see inbound 10 gigabits. Yep. Copying it to the server is only one way, right? So right. do me a favor, change the name of it on the server and then pull it back to his machine. You got it. All right. I like having a Jerry to go back and forth so I don't have to walk. <laughs> I'll bet you, I'll bet you two cents, Jay's two cents that- It's the same, it just has outbound? No slower because it'll be bottlenecked by the SSD on my computer. That's oh, not a, that's that's a, good not point. a one gigabyte. That's, this is literally faster than any of the drives in there except for the NVMe maybe. All right, so now he's copying it over. 3.3, 3.9. Your internal drive is bottlenecking how fast this can copy down. That's awesome. <laughs> no more SATA drives here in this warehouse. Just, they're too slow. So that's pretty much it for this uh, vlog, I guess. This is super nerdy stuff that I wish I knew more about. Like I wish I knew how to actually set up like, uh, like Windows RAID and NAS and all that sort of stuff. But the nice thing about the, the GUI system here, or the GUI setup here with Unraid is that it, literally is just click and play. I mean, it's just that simple. It's up and running. It's more than good enough for what we are doing. We can confidently add drives to this, add cache to it. And uh, if it wasn't for the fact that Jerry came down here, I swear to God, this would not have, this would still be sitting on the floor in the other studio collecting dust because I was just completely like, this was a daunting task for me because I'm a hardware guy, not a software guy. And I know you run raids and stuff and servers at your house. Yeah, and I've used free NAS in the past. But you've never used this before? No. Okay, so why don't you give us like your 60 second review of how this was working with it? All right, so the thing I like about Unraid is that it works a lot like Windows Home Server used to, to work by using each disk independently, having its own file system so that if everything blows up and goes wrong, you can pull it out and put it in your system and recover your data. I love the way that they handle the parity. You do lose some performance because you don't have that striping capability of a regular RAID controller, but what you lose, you gain in convenience. The nice thing about this is because we're allowing the software itself to control the RAID instead of using a complicated RAID controller that we may not be able to get our hands on if we blow it up, we're always assured that we can get another drive in there. If my SAS controller dies, I should be able to just replace it with another SAS controller and we'd be up and running. It could be anything, anything that can connect to those drives. You're right. It's and very resilient. Driver support. Yay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Pe people love that card, by the way, too. So I was really yeah. disappointed FreeNAS didn't support that. But I'm glad everything's working. So, hey, yep. Phil, you have a server now. Hey. Hey, let's go hey. put some games on I like how we high five, but like we, I, we didn't do any. It was like mostly him. <laughs> but we have it though. Yeah. He'll build it, but we have it. You guys yeah. saw it though. Do you think we he put a Minecraft server on here? It's, it's a pretty capable piece of software for the little money they're asking for it. And they're really good about support. So I'm much more comfortable leaving a guy like Jay with this software than I would with the open source free NAS. What do you got there, sir? We're gonna, we're gonna configure this to control our NIC card. Huh? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> hey Phil, I heard I hear these mines crap coins really well. <laughs> <Crap> coins. <laughs> That's what they call the I coins. I hear it does a super job at it. Super. Super.